video. Well, I'm delighted that Jason Reid, who's a political commentator, is here this morning. Good morning, Jason. How are you? Good morning, Peter. Great. Thanks to be with you. And uh, you've been uh, looking through the papers, and there's a big story on the front of the Times. A new record as almost 1,200 migrants cross the channel in a single day. Tell us about this. Yeah, so Boris Johnson is still very unhappy about this and the fact that France are supposedly, supposedly not held, held, holding up their end of the deal when it comes to intercepting uh, boats across the channel. I believe the success rate on this particular day on Thursday was 8%. Uh, the Goodness. French government, um, their excuses were that they had security for Kamala Harris going on, which took some of their resources away. Um, they were also stretched because it was a bank holiday. Um, but it's a bank holiday, therefore, just across the channel because it's a bank holiday. And also we've got uh, uh, something else to do. I mean, that's not a great excuse, really, is it? It's not a great excuse. No, you get the feeling that something has to give here. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on Priti Patel at the Home Office to do something about this. Her, um, her idea about trying to turn back boats in the channel, it seems that Number 10 has come around to the idea that that won't quite work. I think there was a Michael Gove suggestion initially. It was an probably ambitious a one. Probably a breach. Of, ambitious is a good word. Probably a breach of maritime law, by the sound of things. Yeah, quite possibly. Um, but this is becoming more and more urgent as more and more boats crossing the channel. There were reports that I think it was three people are thought to have died on this particular day on Thursday when the record was broken. Um, so it really does need to be sorted out as soon as possible. The situation can't continue Definitely like this that's, much that's, longer. That's horrendous. People taking huge risks there as mm. well, um, hoping for a better life. But of course, they're coming illegally to the country. It's interesting because Pretty Patel, what do you think of this? I mean, Pretty Patel was obviously seen as such a kind of hard, strong figure, someone who really spoke out against this sort of thing over many, many years, someone who's seen, you know, she's one of the few people in Parliament these days who's on record as being in, in favour of the death penalty, for example. I mean, she's someone who has a very strong uh, and, and pretty, you know, clear right-wing credentials on all of this. But she's finding the job of being Home Secretary very difficult, I think. Well, she's certainly, you're absolutely right that she's certainly on the social conservative wing of the party when she was appointed to the Home Office by Boris Johnson. That was interpreted as him staking his flag um, as being tough on crime, tough on law and order and tough on uh, illegal immigration and those kinds of issues. I think Priti Patel still very much holds those views and wants to do those things. And um, perhaps then it's an issue more generally with the Home Office and its ability um, to tackle a difficult issue of this kind. Uh, cynics and critics have, have said that perhaps it's a competence issue, um, that Priti Patel or other uh, ministers aren't up to the job, um, and it seems that there is growing discontent in Number 10 as well, that we've had reports about Boris Johnson being very unhappy with uh, Priti Patel's perceived failure to do anything about this issue in particular with boats crossing the channel. Yeah, it's a big issue. A lot of people are uh, very, very annoyed about it. Let's move to the front page of the Daily Telegraph. Graduates must start paying back loans sooner. Lowering the threshold will cost former students roughly an extra £475 a year. This is interesting, isn't it? Because at the moment, if you're a student, obviously you take this huge level of debt, usually about £9,000 a year. But then when you start earning... The current figure is £27,295 a year, but under new plans that would drop to as low as £22,000. Do you think that's fair, Jason? I don't think it is. There are very few Declare things... Declare your interest. Have you got student debt? I do have student debt, I'm afraid, yeah, and I'm going to assume the authority now to speak on behalf of all young people. You should, yes, actually, um, being a young person, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Because uh, you all think exactly the same way. We do, we're all totally yeah, uniform in our thinking. I always thinking, hate, sorry, sorry to go off on this, but I really hate these programs like young person's question time, or young person's this, or young person's that. Why don't we have 45 to 55 year olds question time? Why don't we have, you know, pensioners question time? Because obviously all those people, just because you're the same age, you obviously think, think exactly the same thing. We need, uh, we need a diverse range of voices, I think. Um, I, I, perhaps I'm biased being on the younger end of the spectrum, but I think the young people's voices tend to be sidelined a little bit more, especially uh, in the media, perhaps. Um, well, you're, you're on now, Jason. Yeah, we're not, exactly. not sidelining you this morning. <laughs> you're not. I'm very grateful. <laughs> <laughs> right. Tell us what you think of this uh, policy, this story. I, I think there are very few things in government you can point to that work really well, but I think the student loan repayment system is possibly one of them. Um, the, the complaint is that taxpayers have to subsidise a lot of higher education, but I think that's exactly the way it's supposed to work. The wealthier graduates who earn a lot and they can pay back their loans, they I do. I think that's a fair point. Why should a Ben man have to subsidise the, the uh, student debt or the student, um, uh, you know, the education of a doctor, for example, who earns four or five times as much as he does? Uh, but exactly, the doctors who earn a lot of money, they're able to, to pay back under this scheme. The vast majority of people earning that level of money, £80,000 or so, they do pay it all back before the 30-year cutoff when the debt gets written off. But the danger here is that by lowering the threshold, all you're doing is making lower-earning people have to pay mm -hmm. more. And that's the opposite, I think, of what you should be doing. If you want to make more money, it should be the 
the, the better, higher earning people who pay a little bit more. I think a better thing to do um, would be something like cutting interest rates on these loans for students, but um, there are some su substantial savings to be had from the Treasury here. The, the estimate on the front page of the Telegraph is that dropping the threshold to £25,000 would save about £1.1 billion. Dropping it to £22,000 would save £2.7 billion. Pounds. Um, I think the core problem here is that we have so many people going to university and yes. we have such this, this huge uh, amount of debt, this huge amount of people with crippling debt who want to be able to buy houses, they want to be able to have families. Um, and so I think making that, that debt burden a little bit more burdensome is uh, not the direction we should be going in at the moment. Jason, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I'm 21. I'm th you're 21 years old, goodness me. I'm, I'm so yeah. old, I'm 37. Um, Jason, tell me, it's interesting, are there people your age and slightly younger who are thinking, is it worthwhile going to university? Is the sort of cost-benefit analysis, is having a degree in something absolutely necessary? Or are they thinking of apprenticeships? Or are they thinking of going into work immediately? What What's the kind of thought? In Speak speak for the youth of Britain today. <laughs> well, I think more and more people are speaking are thinking that way with every year that passes. I thought that way myself. I considered whether it was worth it signing up um, to have this huge amount a lot of, of debt, debt isn't it? Well, how much debt are you? If you don't mind me asking, how much debt are you? I don't remember the exact figure. I think it's it's upwards of fifty thousand yeah. pounds. Oh. Um, but it's, it, which is a terrifying number to have when you're when you're twenty one, entering the world of work after a pandemic. Um, do, you, do you feel as debt, or do you feel as kind of more of more like a tax almost on on being a graduate and having a third level education? This is what I mean by the the repayment system being really good is that it fo it works as a tax, and so it never really becomes. Uh, it's not like a, a payday loan that's going to going to make you bankrupt and make you homeless. It's only when you can pay it back that you do, and it's very manageable sums to begin with when you first cross that threshold of twenty seven thousand pounds and change. Um, and so I think the system works really well, but it works really well because of that high threshold. As soon as you start lowering the threshold, you're penalising lower income graduates. Uh, and that's the opposite of what you should be doing, because those are the people who, besides anything else, the Tories are going to need their votes, uh, I think, in the coming years and the coming decades. And they really want to be able to buy houses. And this is not going to help them do that. Uh, Jason, we're going to talk about more about Boros. We're going to talk, uh, next section, which is Jason uh, Reed is still here. Great to have you with us. Twenty-one years old. I mean, I just I, sorry, I'm just feeling very, very, very old because Jason, you're so mature and you know so much about what's in the news. Because um, the uh, Daily Express, for example, is telling us about the royal family being constantly, uh, constantly berating Harry, uh, and this is Meghan's charge. Uh, tell us more about what she's saying. So this is uh, a text that's come out. Um, that Meghan sent about the, the royal family, as you say, um, as she terms it, berating Harry. This is uh, in the context of the ongoing dispute about the uh, private letter to her father, Thomas Markle, that was published by the Mail on Sunday, and the uh, the revelation that she uh, she claims she forgot that she had communicated with people writing her biography. I mean, we've all been uh, there. We've, we've all been there. I mean, I, I, don't know about you, I don't know when people wrote your biography, Jason, but when people wrote my biography, and I told them loads of stuff. I just forgot about it. I just I forgot all those calls, texts, emails, you know. Commissioning a sycophantic biography and then forgetting about it. We've all been there. Who, who all... amongst us can honestly say? It's an every man problem. She's that, one yeah. of us, isn't she? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, uh, so it's interesting because the, you know, the royal drama really continues here. And this case is a fascinating one as well because we've got her former um, sort of media uh, dude, uh, Jason, I don't know how you pronounce his surname, Knopf? No, North, something don't like know. that. Anyway, he's in he's in court and he's spilling the beans, isn't he? He is. He's uh, he's giving a lot of uh, gossip for the newspapers, if nothing else. Um, but it looks like it's getting very uncomfortable for Meghan and Harry as they are coming under more and more of the spotlight about what actually happened um, and the the lack of understanding in uh, Meghan's perceived lack of understanding in the, in the royal family. She says in these leaked texts uh, that they just don't understand her relationship with her father. The royal family were thinking, why can't Meghan just tell Thomas Markle to stop with all this, uh, these unhealthy allegations? I mean, if there's one family press. that's going to understand a dysfunctional family, it's probably going to be the royal family. You would that's, think so, that, Let's you? face it. Let's face it. <laughs> okay, um, Boris Johnson is paying the price at the polls for the fiasco of the last couple of weeks. Last week, his polling numbers were Tories 38 to Labour 35, and they've been consistently ahead in the polls for some time now. Now Labour are ahead by six percentage points. Labour 40, Tories 34. The Mail says after a week of sleaze, Labour race ahead of the Tories by six points. Could we see an upset in 2024, do you think? 
It's a long way off, but it's the first time that Labour have led a poll in a, in a very long time. There's the usual disclaimers, of course, that it is just one poll. Um, if there were an election cycle, even tomorrow, a huge amount can change over the course of the There's sort election. of a point here and a point there, and there's sort of level in some polls and others yeah. and so on. But this really is, I mean, six points, that's outside the margin of error. That's pretty big, isn't it? It's a really big uh, uh, drop that we've seen the Tories take in the polls as a result of this sleaze scandal. The polling numbers, more generally, about public attitudes towards sleaze are really not good. Uh, for the government at all. For example, a, a huge majority of the public think that Boris Johnson should apologise for the way that he handled um, Why the Why do you think he scandal. hasn't? Because he was, there was a press conference this week. He was at uh, COP, this uh, sort of never-ending um, environmental conference in Glasgow uh, this week, and he was given a number of opportunities by, uh, by journalists to just say sorry for the fiasco of the last couple of weeks. Why do you think he didn't? Well, that's just it, isn't it? We had an international climate summit where we could have been talking about Britain leading the world on climate change, and instead Boris Johnson was having to ensure, assure journalists that Britain is not a corrupt country. It's the yeah, last it's, thing it's not you want great to when doing. you have to when you when you actually say Britain isn't a corrupt country. It's almost as if when you say it, you sort of invite you know we, I, I, you know three weeks ago, I'm not sure too many people were actually saying that Britain was, but the fact that he had to say it sort of speaks volumes, doesn't it? It's been handled appallingly. Uh, I think even people in government would would not. Um, dispute that the, the wrong call has been made and it seems I think the wrong call is being made again it would be easier to just draw a line under this and just apologize and move on uh, but of course the whole Owen Paterson debacle with the with the forcing uh, Tory MP allegedly forcing Tory MPs into voting for overhauling the standards procedure and then you turning the next day none of this has gone uh, at all the way the government wanted it to uh, and so it just seems that this is going to continue until someone it does something a little bit definitive. I don't know what that looks like, whether that's just apologising or changing the rules or somehow uh, convincing uh, the opposition and the public that the that this isn't something that is going to continue. This is allegedly uh, buying peerages and uh, being able to take huge sums of money to um, supposedly lobby for private interests in Parliament, especially when you're a former minister. Um, but the government has a job on its hands if it's going to convince us that it is actually going to put a stop to that. It's going to take something quite radical. And it seems that even the Labour Party doesn't have a solution when they're in opposition. So the government doesn't stand much of a chance. Jason Reid, uh, political commentator, a young man with a bright future. Thank you so much for coming in. Really Thank appreciate you. your time. This